be asked to speak at this. And uh, what I want to talk about today is, well, the title, Gap Theorems for uh, Minimal Submanifolds of Spheres. And as indicated, this the main thing I'm talking about is some recent uh, joint work with Tom Ilmanen. So uh, <coughs> the, the basic question is, uh, consider all k-dimensional minimal submanifolds of the unit n sphere. So it turns out the, uh, the one of least area is the totally geodesic k, k sphere. And the question then is, well, what's, you know, what has the next smallest area? So if you take the infimum among all other k-dimensional minimal submanifolds of Sn, what's the, what's the infimum of area? And just this, uh, about a year ago, there was a, well, there, there's actually very few cases, almost maybe one case when we really know the answer, but anyway, there's a big uh, breakthrough about a year ago. Uh, so Fernando Marquez and Andre Neves, uh, as a, a crucial part of their uh, solution of the Wilmore conjecture gave the answer for k equals 2 and n equals 3. So they show that if you consider all minimal surfaces, all two-dimensional minimal surfaces, closed minimal surfaces in the three sphere, the one of, well, as we said before, the, the smallest area is the totally geodesic S2. What they proved was the next smallest area is uh, attained by the Clifford torus and by, pardon? Pardon? It can't be in the same dimension. Area in the K plus one sphere. Uh, in the n sphere, so n is it's, three, it's n a surface in the three sphere. It's a k-dimensional surface in an n sphere. Oh, so it's k sphere there. What? Oh, he's right. Oh, oh. Do I have the it right thing? K sphere on line three. What is that? Right. It's on. Oh, oh, yeah. oh that's what he meant. Oh, yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, that's the uh, you know, it's a totally geodesic k sphere. K sphere in the n sphere. In the n sphere. Yeah. So we're working in the n sphere. We're looking at k-dimensional submanifolds of the n sphere, and of those, the totally just a k-dimensional sphere has the lowest area. And then, for, if you're talking about two-dimensional in S3, the next smallest turns out to be the Clifford torus. Okay. So, uh, but there was another uh, earlier. Oh, and by the way, I think it's, I, I called it a gap, but it's really, I think it's uh, most natural to look at the ratio. And so, uh, you know, to the, the ratio of the area of the Clifford torus, if you say, what's the smallest ratio? The Clifford torus, you know, you normalize that to, to be one, and then uh, the next smallest thing is the ratio, the Clifford torus, the ratio of that is pi over two, which is about one, uh, yeah, 1.57. Okay, well, uh, it turns out uh, Gene, uh, answered this question, or a version of this question, many, many years earlier in 1967, you could answer the question, instead of asking about all two-dimensional minimal surfaces, you could just ask about minimal surfaces that are topological spheres. And in uh, 1967, Gene uh, answered that. So, uh, among other things, he proved that if you have a, a two-dimensional a two minimal sphere in Sn that is not totally geodesic, then uh, the ratio of its area to 4 pi, of course 4 pi is the area of the totally geodesic, that's the smallest possible, but anything else uh, has to have at least three times as much area, and that's a sharp uh, result. Okay, so you notice I stated the hypothesis in sort of in two ways. I said uh, let M be a two-dimensional sphere that's not totally geodesic, or equivalently you could say it's not contained in a uh, linear three space, uh, and the reason I said that is because Gene went on to answer a much more general thing, namely you could say replace not contained by a three space, not, not contained in a three plane by not complained in, well in a K plane. So you look at all minimal spheres that are not, so fix some K like K equals five or seven or whatever, look at minimal spheres, two spheres in SN that are not contained in any K plane and ask what's the least area of, of among those. And again, uh, Gene gave the, the sharp answer in that same paper. Really beautiful, beautiful result. Okay, um, but until recently, I think that's uh, really all that 
was known about it, and I'm, I really want to ask, well, what about in higher dimensions? Uh, and by the way, you can, let me see if I can make that go away, that little, yeah. Ah, that doesn't help. <laughs> well, okay. Um, so one remark is, it, it's, you can reword the question in, oh, sorry. Yeah, you can reword the question in terms of uh, k plus one dimensional minimal cones. So if you have a, a, a minimal submanifold of the sphere, you form the cone over it, all the rays from the origin that pass through that surface, and you get a minimal cone of one higher dimension. Or conversely, if you have a minimal cone, if you in, minimal cone with vertex at the origin, if you intersect with the sphere, then you get a minimal submanifold of the sphere. So you can ask it about minimal cones or minimal spheres, a uh, minimal submanifolds of the sphere. Um, but uh, anyway, that leads, if you ask in terms of cones, it leads to the related question, which is really uh, a, a sort of motivation, one motivation for, an, for asking the question, and it's was where sort of the starting point for uh, Tom and me. Uh, so we originally were asking a slightly different question, or interested in a slightly different question, namely take uh, an area minimizing hypersurface in Euclidean space, and take an interior point, point out on the boundary, okay, and uh, then the, the density, so you have some, it's just some singular, singular, so in, in general if you take a boundary in high dimensions, you can always find the least area uh, submanifold with that as boundary, but if you're in high dimensions, it's likely to have singularities, okay, and you like to understand, you know, things, of what those singularities are like. And sort of one of the most basic properties of a singularity is what its density is. And so the density is defined as, as follows. You, you uh, density at a point x, you intersect your surface with a ball of radius r centered at x. You look at the area of that intersection and you normalize it by dividing by the area of the cross-sectional disk. So if you're talking about two-dimensional surface, you divide by pi r squared. Okay, so you normalize it. So you take the area in a little ball, you normalize it by dividing by the, the area of the cross-sectional disk, and then you let r go to zero. That's, by definition, the density of the surface at that point. And, of course, in general, if you're talking about general objects, you'd have to, you'd, you don't know the limit exists. You might have to take a limb sup or a limb int. But for minimal surfaces, uh, there's a monotonicity formula that says this, this ratio is an increasing function of r. So therefore, the, the, the limit definitely exists, and that's defined to be the density of M at the point X. Okay. And by the way, well, much of what I, or at least what I'll say at the beginning, I've said area minimizing and hypersurface, and what, I, you know, what I've said so far, it doesn't have to be area minimizing, it could just be a critical point for the area functional. And it doesn't have to be a hypersurface, it could be general co-dimension and so forth. The reason I said area minimizing hypersurfaces is because that's where, uh, that's the category in which we have, uh, you know, we can prove something interesting. Okay. So this density, well notice if you have a smooth uh, embedded submanifold, then the density is one at every point. Okay, because, you know, on a, in a very small ball, the, the manifold looks almost the same as the disk. So it's almost like a disk. You're dividing by there, the cross-sectional disk, it's, you get something close to one. So for any smooth manifold, the density is one everywhere. Uh, if it was smooth and immersed, for instance, then the density would be two, wherever you had a self-intersection. Okay, and density plays an absolutely fundamental role in the uh, regularity theory for minimal varieties uh, and in, for many ways, but one of the most important is the regularity result going back to De Georgi and then generalized uh, by Allard, but it says that, uh, so the density in a, min in a minimal or area, in an area minimizing or even a minimal variety, the density is always greater than or equal to one. At every point the density is greater than or equal to one and you have equality if and only if it's a regular point. Of, of the surface. So I already mentioned that if it's, it's sort of trivial if you have a regular point of the surface the density is one. Okay, but the converse is uh, a deep theorem that conversely if the density is one then it is a regular point. If the, if the, you have this, this minimal variety, you have a point where the density is one then there's a little neighborhood where it's a smooth minimal manifold. So that's the celebrated uh, De Georgi and Allard regularity theorem. <coughs> 
Okay. And in fact, there's some gap. There's a uh, <coughs> so so if the density is equal to one, it's regular. So any any singular point has to have density strictly greater than one. But there's even a gap. There's some delta. So some positive delta. So the density has to be at a singular point has to be greater than uh, there's some delta bigger than one. So the the, the density of singular points are bounded away from one. It's not just that each one is bigger than one, but... Uh, the gap depends on the K and N? Or uh, yeah, a priori, right. Yeah. So the question Tom and I were interested in is, what's the smallest, den what's the smallest possible density of singul a singularity? So just consider all area minimizing hypersurfaces of any dimension. Look at the singularities. Say, what's the least possible density of such a singularity. Some is bigger than one, but what is it? And uh, as I say, if you, if you work over all dimensions and so forth, it's not even clear there is a minimum, so uh, it's attained. So the precise question would be, what's the infimum of densities of area minimizing hypersurfaces uh, at singular points? What's the least possible density of any area minimizing hypersurface at any singular point? Okay. And again, you could ask this about you know, other categories of minimal surfaces. You don't have to ask about hypersurfaces. You know, if you ask about more general things, you might get a different answer. Or if you just looked at uh, uh, so minimal surfaces, just things that are critical points for the area functional instead of <coughs> minimizers, you could get a different answer. If you ask for stable things, but you, know, you might. So depending on what class of, of uh, minimal varieties you're looking at, you might get a different answer to this question. But the one we wanted to study is, is area minimizing hypersurfaces. So that was that's sort of the, the key question we were hoping, uh, we, we were trying to, uh, uh, you know, make progress on. Okay, so the uh, first, there's a simplification, and that is, uh, a simplif you can simplify to the special case of cones from arbitrary area minimums and varieties, just a case, a special case of cones. And the way is the follows. Well, you take, let X be a singular point of any area minimizing hypersurface, well, it turns out there's, you know, you, if you dilate about that point x, if you take a limit of dilations, that will converge to a cone, called so called the, the tangent cone, to the surface at x. So you take your x, take a sequence of dilations about x. If you pass to a subsequence, that's guaranteed to converge to an area minimizing cone called the tangent cone to m at x. And that cone, if you if if your original point x was a singularity, then the cone will also be singular at that point. Okay, so the tangent. If you start with a, a, a minimizing hypersurface, a singular point, take the tangent cone. The tangent cone will also be singular at its vertex, and the two densities will be the same. Okay, and it's convenient to so the density of a cone at its vertex. Just I'll abbreviate. Just say that's the density of the cone. When I say density of cone, I mean density of the cone at the vertex. So uh, <clears throat> so instead of Instead of working with all area minimizing, asking what's the least possible density of singularities among all area minimizing hypersurfaces, you could just ask, what's, what, about, what about area minimizing cones? And you get the same answer by this reasoning. So question two is, what's the infimum of density of, the, of a cone among the class of all singular area minimizing hypercones? Okay, so it simplifies it. You just have to look at cones. You have to look at arbitrary. Uh, minimizing hypersurfaces. Okay, but then there's a second simplification. Uh, reduction, you can reduce to the case of simple cones. So I'll say a cone is simple if it's smooth except at its vertex. Okay. So, or equivalently, uh, that means if, if you intersect the cone with the sphere, you have a smooth submanifold. But possibly reverse. Pardon? Could it be but immersed, perhaps? Well, it turns out if in area minimizing, it'll automatically be embedded. But in general, if you're talking about minimal things in general, it might be immersed, yeah. So, uh, you know, if you look at things like soap films, you know, if you take something like this, you know, you, you see this kind of cone as a tangent cone in soap film. So that's an example that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it's singular all along this, this edge. So this is not simple or, you know, even more complicated. You also see things that look like this and cones that look like this in a soap film, kind of the, uh, so the, a cone where if you intersect with a sphere, you get a kind of uh, tetrahedron made out of, you know, totally geodesic arcs. So that, again, would be not a simple one. 
Okay, so simple, a simple cone is a cone that's smooth except at the vertex. And there's an uh, important principle in the regularity theory, so-called dimension reducing. It says, suppose you take any singular area minimizing hypercone, uh, take, take a singular area minimizing hypercone. Suppose it's not simple. Take, take one that's not, you'd, you'd like it to be simple. Suppose it's not simple. Then uh, dimension reducing tells you you can find a simple cone uh, that has, whose dimension is strictly less and whose density is no bigger. Okay. Okay, so, so you know, take, take a cone, maybe it's not simple, but if it's not simple, you can find another singular cone of lower dimension uh, that, um, well, in fact, a simple one of lower dimension uh, that has no more density. But how is C prime related to C? How's it related? Well, for this question, it doesn't matter, but, but, uh, but I mean, I can kind of show you in a, uh, uh, a picture. Let's see, so what we could do is, um, right, so, so if it's, let, let's take this, this example. So you can show if it's, if it's not simple, that means the, the uh, it's actually got a ray of singularities, right? The, the cone has, if it's not simple, it doesn't have just a, the singularity at the vertex, but there's a whole ray of singularities. So in this picture here is an example of a ray of singularities. Now I take the tangent cone to the tangent cone at a point along the ray. If you do that, like in this case, if you do that, you'll get this guy. When you do that, you always get one that's translationally invariant in one direction. And so if you slice, you get something of lower dimension. You just keep on going until you get something simple. And the monotonicity formula guarantees you you'll get, as you do that, of course, the dimension goes down, but also the density can only go down when you do that. That's where this comes from. So question three, which is equivalent to the other two, is uh, you can just say, well, it's enough to consider simple area minimizing cones. So question three is, what's the infimum of, of density among all simple singular area minimizing hypercones C? So as, as I've explained, questions one, two, and three are all equivalent. So we've reduced to this case of just cones, you, instead of general surface cones, and it's enough to look at cones that are smooth except at the, at the vertex. Okay, so um, Tom and I haven't been able to, to settle that, but we can give a sharp result under one hypothesis. So the main result is uh, suppose you take a simple singular area minimizing hypercone. So the, the extra hypothesis we have to assume is that it's topologically non-trivial, which I'll explain in a minute what that is. But the, the theorem says if you take such a hypercone, if it's topologically non-trivial, then the density is strictly greater than square root of two. And furthermore, that is optimal. In other words, that really is the infimum among all such cones. Like all simple, so simple area minimizing, uh, <coughs> topologically non-trivial, the infimum of density among all such cones is exactly square root of two. Okay, and the definition here of topologically non-trivial is these cones, such cones, always divide the ambient Euclidean space into two components, and uh, so for us, topologically non-trivial means at least one of those components is non-contractible. And I just mentioned that there are now many, many known examples of uh, singular area minimizing, minimizing hypercones. Of course, one, you know, one, one way you could ask this question is if you could classify all the cones and you just see which one in your classification has the least density. But such a classification seems, is, you know, it's probably hopeless. It's probably totally impossible to do that. But still, people have constructed many, many examples of singular area minimizing hypercones. And all the known examples are topologically non-trivial. Right. Okay, so why is the square root of two optimal? Well, uh, that is shown by the, the so-called Simon's cones. So if you just consider in, uh, you know, in R, the dimensions I have, I guess, you know, in Rn plus one cross Rn plus one, you look at all the things where the norm of the first n coordinates is the same as the norm of the, the first coordinates is the same as the norm of the last coordinates. So. 
schematically it's like this. If, if n were equal to zero, it'd be exactly this picture. This would be the Simon's cons. This would be, this is, I guess, what do I call it? CNN? Yeah. So, so C11 would just be the, the, these two cross lines in the plane. But anyway, that's, um, so th this cone is, uh, it's a minimal cone for all n, but it's uh, area minimizing for n greater than or equal to 3. And for, oh, it's C11, maybe. Sorry, this would be C00, anyway. Well, CN, anyway. Um, so so the, these cones are generalizations of the Clifford torus. Okay, so, so these, if, for n greater than or equal to 3, all these uh, Simons cones are area minimizing. They are topologically non-trivial. And their densities go to square root of 2 as, uh, uh, as n goes to infinity. So what Tom and I prove is the density for such a cone, any such cone, has to be greater than square root of 2. And um, uh, then the Simons cones show you can't do any better than that. <coughs> Because there are, there are cones whose areas are as close to square root of 2 as you like. Okay, now we also uh, proved some sharper bounds in terms of topology. So remember the definition of, of being um, topologically non trivial is that one of the components is non contractible. Well, if, if, if a component is non-contractible, it means it has some non-vanishing homotopy group, some non-trivial homotopy group. And so you could then, uh, you could get a bound, try to ask for a bound in terms of what, which homotopy group is non-trivial. Instead of just saying non-trivial, you could say, well, suppose it's not simply connected, or suppose pi 2 of it is non-zero, or so forth. So, and it turns out our methods let you answer that question as well. So take a, a simple area minimizing hypercone and suppose one of the components of complement has non-trivial kth homotopy. Okay. So of course you know by being topologically non-trivial it means this hypothesis will be true for some k. But now suppose you fix the k. Okay. In terms of the k you get the bound well. If it has non-trivial kth homotopy then its density has to be greater than an explicit number which I've written down here. And uh, dk, a kind of odd looking number at first, uh, but, but anyway, uh, and again, that, that the constant is optimal. So if you take the, for instance, if you take the, you know, you could take the enthema among all cones where at least one of the components of the complement is not simply connected, yeah. and then the enthema would be this number d1. Okay. And by the way, this, this number, dk, is sort of odd number with pi and you know, e in the denominator and so forth. Well, some of it's natural, like the, the, the sigma k is the area of the unit k sphere, so that seems kind of natural in this setting, but you know, where does e come in? It's not so obvious that should come into this at all. Uh, but this dk has a very nice meaning, which uh, you'll see in a minute. Okay, so. Uh, I want to uh, basically show you the proof of this, this theorem, the square root of 2 theorem. Uh, and so there, it uses just a, a few facts that I want to tell you about. So one of the key facts is, uh, I've already talked about the density, but uh, an important property of the density is that it's upper semi-continuous. The density of a surface, now we're always talking about minimal surfaces, not arbitrary surfaces, but for minimal surfaces, for things that are critical for the area functional. The density is an upper semi-continuous function of both m and x, the surface and the point. Okay? So if you have a sequence of minimal varieties mn converging to m and xn converging to x, then you have this, this thing. The, the density of the limit is greater than or equal to the limb. I guess you should say limb soup of the... But anyway, yeah. So when, when, you, when you pass to a limit, the density can jump up, but it can never jump down. And Um, just pick your favorite one. Weak convergence, like a varifolds, you know, but because you or flat. Because you reduce any way to a strong convergence by standard regularity theory. 
Well, it doesn't. It doesn't really use this. This is sort of pre-regularity. It just this follows just from monotonicity and nothing else. So, oh, okay. uh, it sort of uh, any any sort of notion of weak convergence would work here. Weak convergence of varifolds or flat convergence of uh, integral currents, whatever. So, for instance, uh, one. Of course, this is minimal, not area minimizing, but you know one. If you look at an, an immersed surface, uh, that you can see that. I mean, you can see an example of it. The density, at all the points where it's embedded, the density is one. So if you take a sequence of points, you know, moving to where it's immersed, suddenly the density jumps up to two. So that, that just illustrates how it can be upper semi-continuous as a function of the point x. But um, to see its upper, to give an example of it being upper semi-continuous as a function of the surface, uh, let's consider two, uh, say, lines. So one-dimensional minimal surfaces in R3, namely straight lines. So if you take two straight lines in R3, that's a minimal variety. And if you move them together, density is one everywhere. But if you move them together, suddenly, boom, when they intersect, the density jumps up at the intersection point to two. So anyway, those are examples where you see the density can jump up. Uh, but as I say, you can prove it's very easy, it follows from the mont history formula, that uh, the density can never jump down. So it's, it's upper semi-continuous. Not continuous, but it's upper semi-continuous. So that's one in key, key ingredient uh, in our proof. Another key fact is a beautiful, uh, uh, wonderful fact about minimal hypercones proved by Hart and Simon back in 1985. So take any simple area minimizing hypercone then that cone is part of a foliation. That, it turns out that cone is one leaf of a foliation of our of the Euclidean space by minim, area minimizing hypersurfaces. Now, of course, the, the cone is singular, but all the other leaves are smooth. So it's I say foliation, but you know the, there's exactly one leaf that has exactly one singular point. So. Uh, so schematically, you know, here's say so here's your your cone, uh, then, now remember, you know, it doesn't look like this in my picture, but this should be dividing the ambient space into two components. So you should think of this and this as being the same component, and this and this being the same component. So it says, uh, so that the, the, the complement is, it's part of a foliation, so the complement, here's one leaf of the, here's the leaf on one side of the cone, okay? And part of the theorem, I don't know if I stayed here, yeah, the leaves are all smooth radial graphs. So if you, if you take a ray from the origin, it intersects this, this leaf exactly once. So these, these surfaces are all radiographs. And furthermore, they're all, the ones on one side of the cone are all related to each other by dilation. So once you have one leaf, you get all the others just by dilating that one. So you have a bunch on one side, here you have a bunch on one side, and then you have you know, different leaves on the other side. Why are those leaves area minimized? Well, they were, uh, I mean, they're proof, they were, they were constructed to be, oh, well, okay, there are several ways of saying that. Um, they, they constructed it by, I mean, they constructed leaves by, by minimizing area. By, so, it, but it's also a true fact that anytime you have a foliation by minimal hypersurfaces, that automatically implies they have a very strong area minimizing property. So sort of by construction, but even if you didn't know their construction, once you have this foliation, you could conclude, oh, they have to, to be area minimizing in a very strong sense. Okay, oh well, here I, I drew a picture of it, so the same picture I just drew, but cone, except it's sideways, but anyway, there, there's the cone, and then it's, it's part of this foliation. Okay, the, then the third thing uh, is uh, we use mean curvature flow. So, uh, you know, mean curvature flow, you start with some manifold with boundary. People usually do it with manifolds without boundary, but you can do it with boundary, and for us we need it to do it with boundary. So let's start with a minimal surface with boundary. And, uh, <clears throat> well, if we do it without, without boundary, you just take, you know, a surface, and then you let it evolve so at each point its velocity is equal to the mean curvature. Okay, so if you take a curve at each point, like I've drawn here, each point you know, where the curve curves one way, it starts moving the other way. So it moves, in, for the curve, it just moves with velocity equal to its curvature, so it starts moving along. Now, people, as I say, people, when they study this problem, they usually do it for closed curves or closed surfaces. But you can just as well do surfaces with boundary. And in that case, if you have a boundary, well, you could just fix the boundary. You fix the boundary and let the surface move. Or you can also, you can prescribe the motion of the boundary. 
just like you know, when you solve the heat equation, you, know, you, you subscribe the, on the bar, you prescribe the temperatures, the endpoints, and the heat equation tells you what happens in between. Same thing here. You can move the endpoints however you like, and then the equation will make the curve move accordingly. Okay, so you, you can prescribe the motion of the boundary, and then the, the equation, velocity equals mean curvature, gives you a flow of the surfaces away from the boundary. Okay, now those, uh, turns out, again, if, if you're, um, even if you start with a smooth surface, as it flows, it's likely to develop singularities. So there's a regularity theory for mean curvature flow, just as there is for minimal surface. There's also a monotonicity formula due to Gerhard Huskin, and there's associated notion of density. So at a, a space-time point, so you know, this, this flow, you should really think of it as happening in space-time. There are points, you know, there's a point, if a singularity happens, it happens at a certain point x at a point t. So you have a singularity in space-time, and there's an associated density of that singularity. The formula is more complicated, so I won't write it down. The monitor is more complicated, but um, it has the same, same general properties as the density and minimum, the density for minimal, sur the you know density we talked about for minimal surfaces. Okay, so in particular, that that uh, the density for curved mean curvature flow, it's a more complicated. Let's say the formula looks a lot more complicated, but it has the same properties. In particular, it depends upper semi-continuously on both arguments, on the space-time point where the singularity happened, also on the, the flow. It's upper semi-continuous. Um, and uh, another thing that's important, so it's, it's a little confusing here, you have these two different notions of quite di the very different looking definitions of density, but uh, fortunately they're compatible in the following way. Let's take a minimal variety, you know, minimal cone or anything else. Take any minimal, minimal variety. Well. If you let it flow by mean curvature, it just sits there because its mean curvature is zero everywhere, right? So if you take any minimal variety and let it flow by mean curvature, it doesn't move. So any minimal variety you can think of as a solution of mean curvature flow. It's a solution that just a static solution. A, minim a minimal variety is the same as a static solution of mean curvature flow. So a priori, that's uh, problematic because now we have two different definitions of density. The minimal variety, we could give the density, I wrote, the definition I wrote down, or you could think of it as a static flow, and there's the more complicated definition I didn't write down. But fortunately, in that case, where both definitions apply, they give the same number. Okay. And again, that would be important to us. Okay, so now let me uh, give you the outline of the proof of the main theorem I stated about square root of 2. So we start with a, a simple, topologically non-trivial, area-minimizing hypercone. And uh, now I want to intersect it with the unit ball. Of course, the cone goes on forever. It has no boundary. But now I want to intersect the cone with the unit ball. So I only look at the part of the cone in the unit ball. And so... So now I have a minimal variety in the unit ball, and its boundary is this, you know, manifold in the in the in the sphere. Okay, so now I have a, a minimal variety, minimal cone, but with boundary, and I think of that as a static mean curvature flow. Okay, so what we want to so th this is the way our proof goes. What we do is we approximate that static flow by Minim, by mean curvature flows that are really moving, okay, by dynamic mean curvature flows. So this, this static flow, let me just call it M, that's where the cone just sits there and doesn't move. But now we approximate it by a sequence of mean curvature flows where the surfaces are really moving. So we find a sequence of, of dynamic mean curvature flows that converge to this static one. Okay. Next we show that each of these guys has a singularity. So each of if each of them has a, each of these guys has a singularity, space-time singularity x in, uh, at which the density is well. Is greater than square root of two. Okay. And now, 
Furthermore, we show that, uh, well, and so the singular is happening somewhere or another, but by passing to a subsequence, we can assume that these converge to some space time point x. Okay? But now by the upper semi-continuity of density, <coughs> here we have a sequence of flows with, with singularities with density greater than square root of 2. That means by upper semi-continuity, the, the density of the limit flow at the limit point has to be greater than or equal to the limb soup of the density of the nth flow at the nth point. And this is, well, okay, I'm not going to quite get the greater than. I'll only get greater than or equal to. But each of these is great, greater than the square root of 2, so. Okay. So, and now, but, but then uh, by the compatibility, this density is in fact the same as the density of the cone. So what we proved is there's some point on this cone where the density is greater than, square root of, greater than or equal to square root of 2. Of course, all these points are regular, so they have density 1. So in fact, it's this point. So we, we end up showing that point has, of the minimal variety has, um, has density square root of 2. Yeah, the point x must be the vertex because the density is way, uh, 1 away from the vertex. Okay, so, um, so the basic, in a nutshell, the basic strategy of this proof is you take the problem and you reduce it to a harder problem. Because <laughs> the original problem is, you know, try to understand singularities of minimal, of, of just static cur mean curvature flows. And that already seems quite hard. Now instead you reduce the problem considering dynamic, you know, general mean curvature flows seem much harder than minimal surfaces. But, but anyway, here, fortunately, uh, it actually helped us instead of making things worse. So I'll show you that. So, uh, so let me fill, just elaborate a little bit. So the uh, two questions, one, where do those approximating flows come from? And then in those approximating flows, how do you get this square root of 2 bound? So uh, well, I guess I have, I think I have a slide with the picture anyway. So what we do is, so maybe it help, maybe helps draw. So what we do is we, st we start with this, uh, I say we look at our cone, the portion of our cone in the unit, in the unit ball. And now remember it's part of that foliation by minimal, area minimizing hypersurfaces. So what we do is we take the leaf on one side that's very, that comes very close to the origin, maybe distance. So we'll, we'll start, say, with this. This is a leaf on one side that comes maybe distance 1 over n to the origin. Okay? And now I'm going to, so what I want to do is I want to describe the, this, this approximating mean curvature flow to you, okay? So, this, so what we do is up to time 0, like from time minus infinity to time 0, this is our flow. It's just a minimal surface. It just sits there. It doesn't do anything. Its mean curvature is zero, so it has no reason to move. It would just sit there forever if we let it. But remember, we're allowed to move the boundary. So now at time zero, we start moving the boundary. And we move the boundary until, so we actually move the boundary through the, where those leaves intersect the sphere. Okay, so we, s we start moving the, move the boundary. And as we move the boundary, that forces the surface to start moving too by mean curvature flow. Okay. And we move our boundary until we end up on the boundary of the leaf that, that's on the other side. Let me just draw dotted lines here. So I'm, I'm not moving the surfaces directly. I'm, I'm only moving the boundaries. And then mean curvature is deciding what mean curvature flow decides what happens to the surfaces. Okay, but um, I start here and I move the boundary until I get to here, and I stop when I get when I, my boundary is on this leaf that say is distance one over n on the other side. Okay. Okay, now, by the way, these, so, so I'm moving, you know, moving the boundaries just through these, these, through where the leaves intersect the sphere, but the, then I let the surface move by mean curvature flow. The surface definitely will not, th that flow will not be along those leaves, because those leaves have mean curvature zero. They wouldn't move at all. So as soon as I start, 
Ln plus on the picture. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me see. Ln plus is where we, Ln minus is, uh, let's see. Yeah, we start on Ln minus. So the way I was drawing it, I, I was, this is my starting point, Ln minus. Right. And then I move and it'll flow and. Uh, where is Ln plus? Okay, so, uh, yeah, okay, so, 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 sorry, yeah, Ln minus is the leaf on one side that's distance one over n from the origin. Ln plus is the leaf on the other side that's distance one over n from the origin, okay? So what I want, what I claim we can do is find a mean curvature flow that starts with this one and as t goes to infinity goes to that one, okay? And the way we do that, remember, what we have control over is what the boundary does. So I'll, I'll just take this, I'll take the, the boundary of my starting leaf and I'll move it till it's at the boundary of what I want my limit leaf to be, okay? But again, I don't get to control what happens inside. Mean curvature flow does that, okay? But it turns out if you do that, if you do what I just said, you start moving here and then you stop when you get here, then as t goes to infinity, you can prove the flow does converge to the leaf Ln plus. Okay, there, um, so yeah, here some, the colors probably don't match up at all, but anyway, yeah, the initial surface is the leaf on one side and the final surface as t goes to infinity, it, it, it flows to the corresponding leaf on the other side. Okay, so it it's, turns out it's not hard to show, by the way, that it does flow to this because all those leaves kind of act as barriers. That's the only thing that it could possibly flow to, basically, and so it flows to that. Okay, but now this is where the topologically non-triviality, you remember our hypothesis was that the cone was topologically non-trivial. That implies easily that this leaf is not isotopic to this one. So that means you know, you have this deformation and some, they're not isotopic, so when you flowed from one to the other, there had to have been a singularity somewhere in between. So there, there has to be a singularity. Uh, okay, that's just saying the same thing. I'm, that's rep repetition of the earlier thing. Okay, so why square root of two? Well, um, so as I said, you know, here, as it, it first, you know, it's, it seems like we've, We've made things worse. Now we need to know. We just wanted to prove a bound of square root of two for minimal varieties. Now we need to prove the same. We want to say the same bound for general singularities of mean curvature flows. But these are very. This is a very special kind of mean curvature flow. It's called uh, a mean convex flow. So notice when we started moving the boundary, we moved it in one direction, away from you know towards one side of the surface, and we kept on moving it always you know, in one direction, you know, sort of positive multiple of the unit normal. And that implies by a maximum principle, actually, that these surfaces, as they flow, they're always, the maximum principle tells you that the uh, mean curvature for these, these moving surfaces, once they start moving, will always be positive. Okay, the surfaces always move in one direction. Okay, and that's a very, very strong, nice condition. So in general, we, you know, we know much less about singularities and mean curvature flow than we know about minimal singularities of minimal surfaces. But the one case when you have a, a pretty good understanding of singularities of mean curvature flow is that mean convex case. For mean convex flows, we roughly have a cl classification of the singularities. Singularities are all self-similar shrinking spheres or cylinders. So what that means, if you take a surface flowing by mean curvature, if, 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 these, if it's always moving in one direction, if the surface are mean convex and a singularity forms, if you look at it, look at the surface under a microscope, just before the singularity, what you either see is essentially a sphere or a cylinder. Okay, so the, the sphere case, for instance, uh, there's a celebrated theorem of Fuskin, one of the first things, theorems, big breakthroughs. If you take any, say, convex, convex body, uh, convex body in Rn and let it flow by mean curvature, he proved it, it shrinks to a point and as it shrinks, it becomes rounder and rounder. So it's asymptotically spherical. So again, as I say, if you look at it under a microscope, right before it disappears, what you see is essentially a sphere. Okay, and another kind of singularity would be if you have uh, uh, well, I mean, I could, suppose you have a very, very thin torus of revolution. That's also mean convex. The mean curvature is always pointing inward, so as it flows, it always moves in one direction. And of course, by symmetry, 
it shrinks until it becomes a circle. And again, if you look at it under a microscope, right before it shrinks away, you see basically a cylinder. Okay, but it can be more common, you know, it wouldn't have to be if it's an asymmetrical torus. You know, it's, it's sort of thin, or it, it's a torus, mean convex, but it's thinner. On part. You know, the, it'll, this part will shrink away before that does, so you get a kind of neck pinch. But again, we know that when the singularity forms, you sort of have a cusp, and if you look under a microscope just before the singularity, what you see is essentially a cylinder. So that's what I mean when I say they've been classified. Uh, for mean convex flow, the singularities all look like either shrinking spheres or shrinking cylinders. And you know what those Huskin densities are at those things, namely the, the density at one of these, uh, if you have a, a shrinking uh, cylinder, so that's an SK cross R something or another, then its density is given by this formula. Okay, And in particular, these numbers are all uh, greater than square root of 2. Okay. So again, we, we had this, we had our flow, uh, it flowed around, we knew just topologically the singularity had to happen because it's a mean convex flow, we know roughly speaking what that singularity looks like, we have a classification, and the singularity had that, that singularity had to have had density square root of 2. Okay. Pardon? Sigma k is the area of the unit k sphere. Well, it, okay, but the, the uh, that it, that's a purely local thing. So it's the same if you're away from the boundary, which we are. It's the same. Okay. So anyway, this this uh, right. So we we got that the density is greater than than dk, but dk is is greater than square root of two. So that's the uh, theorem. And uh, so, yeah, one interesting thing. So, of course, this, this theorem, as I said, it's sharp. In a sense, it is sharp, but in some sense, I mean, it's sharp only because we're taking infimum over all dimensions. So if, we, if we looked in a particular dimension, if you looked at, uh, you know, minimal hypercones in R10 or something, our result would not be sharp. So, in some sense, it's asymptotically sharp. Okay, so, uh, if you take the infimum over all dimensions, all minimal source in all dimensions, then it's square root of 2. But it's kind of surprising. The bounds are very good, even in low dimensions. So, for example, let's take the one that says, you know, it gives you a bound if, if the complement, if one part, if one component of the complement is not simply connected, then the density is greater than this number D1. I guess I erased it, but yeah. So, if, if, one, if one component of the complement is not simply connected, then the, the density of the cone has to be bigger than D1, this number with a 1. Okay. Well, the smallest known example of a uh, min of an area minimizing hypercone that that uh, has that property is the cone over S1 cross S6. So I guess that's a eight-dimensional cone in R9. Uh, anyway, so that's that's the that's the the smallest dimensional example we know that satisfies the hypothesis. Its density is 1.523. And our bound is 1.520. So the, the bound is, you know, rather good. Even though the bound, it, we only prove its bound is optimal when you go off to infinity. But it seems rather good even in low dimensions. And everything I said, were, you know, is for area minimizing hypersurfaces. But actually, by modifications, we can say some things about uh, cones that are not area minimizing. And for instance, uh, the methods implied that the density of a simple singular minimal hypercone in R4 is greater than or equal to 1.52. And uh, of course, by uh, Marquez, I said Cotto, but it's really Marquez. Marquez and Neves, the best constant is 1.57. So it's, it's the, the, the constants are not bad, even in very low dimensions. OK, um, so let me just mention some interesting up in questions. So, uh, you know, conjectures or whatever. So one is that the uh, you know, it seems reasonable to guess that these Simons cones, you know, achieve the minimum in any particular dimension. We only know that in the case of uh, of n equals one. That's a recent result. Again, the 
It's part of the solution of the Wilmore problem. Uh, well, if you're in an odd dimension, you know, that cone doesn't exist, but, you know, Sn cross Sn minus 1, the cone over that seems like a good candidate. Again, now if you look at, look at cones, uh, if you look at, you know, if, if you again look in a fixed dimension and look at the cones where one of the components, say, has non-trivial k-dimensional homotopy, again, so in those, these conjectures are all basically that, you know, the, the minimum should be attained by a, a, a sub-manifold that's the product of two spheres, just because those are kind of the simplest ones. But uh, anyway, our, our, you know, in our theorem says that asymptotically those really are the best, but we don't know they're best in any particular dimension except in the case any, you know, the, the, the case of two-dimensional in, in S3. Uh, another problem is higher co-dimension. Uh, you know, our techniques, I can't imagine any technique, you know, our, our technique is very strongly for hyperserves in many ways. I, I have no idea how to begin to attack the, you know, this kind of thing in higher co-dimension. Of course, Gene's result was for higher co-dimension, but uh, if you talk about higher dimension and higher co-dimension, I have no idea. And then, um, one thing that uh, now, say an home is explain why the proof gives good bounds. So this is something that uh, I find completely baffling. You know, we, we had this proof, and you know we were very happy to get any bound whatsoever. You know, it's, but okay, you do the proof and you give, get some some bound. But you know, the proof the proof said nothing about Clifford Tori or anything. You know, it, did, it almost you know didn't seem to have much to do with any particular minimal surface you know you, so you get some bound and then you know just it seems like just sort of by a miracle it happens that that bound is is sharp you know so i but i i've at least asymptotically sharp but uh it seems like there must you know it it doesn't seem like there could, there could just be a coincidence but as they have no you know from the proof it just seems like a, a miracle that, that happens to happen you know the proof gives you lower bounds, and then there happen to be these examples that give the lower bounds. You know, usually when you prove something as sharp, you know, you prove a sharp inequality, you know, sharp isoparametric inequality or something, you can, then you can kind of see how this, the, you know, the, the, this critical case, all the inequalities become equalities or something. But here it's not like that. So. Anyway, okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. I'm a little bit confused about the k-dimensional homotopy in the bounds. You're saying that if, if one of the components has non-trivial k-dimensional homotopy, then the bound is a function. The lowest, the lower bound is a function of k, which goes up. Uh, which, yeah. Which goes up with k. But or, sorry, it goes down with k. But does it goes down with k? Yeah. So, for instance, d1. Um, and you know those numbers. The formula is kind of complicated. So if you just look at the formula, it's not very obvious. But, um, but uh, uh, d1 was I think about 1.52 uh, roughly, and sort of d infinity. The limit of these d's was uh, square root of two. Oh, okay. So okay. That, yeah. I was worrying about Yeah, that would <laughs> Yeah, if you restrict your class of cones, yeah, you should have a bigger infimum rate. Questions? Do you think there are trivial area minimizing cones? Uh, topologically topologic trivial? trivial? You know, I would I would kind of guess so just cuz why not, you know, but I mean I have no idea, you know, I have no reason to think one way or the other. Your guess is as good as mine. What do you think? <laughs> yes, I agree. There are, you know, Wu Yisheng and some other people made examples of uh, minimal hypercones, where, in fact, the, the link is, is minimal, you know, topologically trivial. In fact, the link is, is, a, is, a, is topologically a sphere. But those are not known to be area minimizing. I don't know if so, I mean, there's some candidates. There's th there are already things that exist that might be examples of, of, uh, of topologically trivial hypercones, but who knows? Mm hmm.
look at, why did, I didn't really tell you where a k came in. I, I told you the square root of 2. Okay, so, so, well, so let, me, let me just go back a minute and say, well, what, hap, what if you started with a, a topological cone that, was, a cone that was topologically trivial? Well, you could do the same argument. You could still make this flow. But if it's topologically trivial, these two leaves are isotopic. So for all you know, the flow, there still exists this flow that takes you from one leaf to the other, but maybe it's smooth for all time. So that's where we have to use uh, the non-triviality. And for the square root of two thing, all we, that's all we need to know. We just need to know there's some singularity, and since it's mean convex, that density is bigger than square root of two. But if you, um, uh, if you know something about the topology, not just that the topology changed, but you know something about the way the topology changed, then you can say more about the singularity. So, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, so it, it's, it's just, it's kind of like, you know, with the Morse function, you know, something about the manifold that tells you something about what kinds of, uh, uh, you know, what kind of critical points you have. So it's, it's the same idea here. You, you, not only do you have a singularity, but you know, certain, you know, you know these singularities are all like shrinking spheres and cylinders, but um, uh, for instance, um, you know, if you, if you took a shrinking sphere, that wouldn't change the fundamental group. So you'd have to have, you know, so knowing something about the topology puts a restriction on which of these tells you you have to see certain kinds of singularities and then you get a better bound for that reason. Yeah? Yeah, you get the things for lower dimensions by just knowing which DK could possibly uh, come, become involved in your construction. Well, is that all it is? I mean, is that, I mean, is that the you know, for dimension three or four or whatever? Well, okay, first of all, unfortunately, I mean, you know, we don't even have area minimizing guys until you're up to, well, yeah, yeah. you know, seven dimensional on R8. So this whole, you know, this, this program sort of doesn't make sense until you're in high dimensions. Because just, you know, there, the, you know it's the, the first, the lowest, uh, the smallest dimension in which you get a, a singular hypercone for area minimizing when it's seven dimensional on R8. Yeah? How do you extend the flow through the singularity? Ah. For those kind of things, I mean, the <laughs> singularity, could you have some problems? No, but, yeah, it's a, that's a great question. So, um, Can you repeat the question? Okay, the question is how, well, how do you extend the flow past the singularity? So, um, mean curvature flow has been studied a lot in recent years by different people, and there's sort of uh, two groups of people that answer that question in different ways. One group says we don't, you know. So, you, you, you know, you can just sort of, <laughs> you can solve it by, by PDE. You know, you can just, just look at it as, a, as sort of looking at PDE. And then, and so people who are mainly using PDE generally study the flow up to the singular time. The first time a singular happens, then they stop. Uh, but fortunately for us, there are also, um, uh, there's a good week, there's several Actually, there's several different weak notions of mean curvature flow that let you talk about something being a flow even after the singularities happen. Now, there are several different definitions, and they're not, unfortunately, they're not equivalent definitions, but fortunately, when you're dealing with mean convex, mean convex surfaces, those different definitions all agree in that special case. So, um, anyway, there, there are ways to talk about weak solutions, and then you can, you can flow right past the, the singularity. And of course, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think for us it's a really, you have to be able to do that. For, I think, oh, actually, for if, if you just want the square root of 2 result, you, you, it turns out you really wouldn't have to, to go all the way. You just have to know a singularity happens, and that, that's good enough. You don't need to, to keep going. You know, you say that, well, I can't flow forever without a singularity because that's a you know, topological contradiction. So singularity happened. You could, yeah, for, this, for the argument I showed you, it'd be enough to just to work up to the time of the first singularity. But if you want to get that sharper thing about the, depending on the, the, um, uh, the bound, depending on K, depending on the topology, then you have to consider these weak flows because the problem is, you know, let's say, let's say we flow around. So if, 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 one, if this region, if you know this region has, is not simply connected, pi 1 is not trivial, then 
what you need to know, this is a true fact, that at some point, you, you may have many singularities, but you need to know at some point, this is a true fact, that if, if pi 1 is not trivial, then at some point you had to have an S1 cross R whatever type singularity. Okay, you had, in other words, and that means you had to have a singularity with density D1 in that flow. Okay, so, but, but there's, you know, there's no reason that has to be the only singularity, the first singularity. So you might, as you're flowing along, maybe the first singularities are, are you know, or hot, you know, S2 cross something or S3 cross something. So you have to flow, you know, have to keep on, you, know, you, don't, you can't stop there. You have to keep on flowing until you get to the D1 singularity. So for the, the, the first result, you don't need to flow past the singularity, but for the second one, you do. Further questions? Let's thank the speaker again.